Good morning um, and good afternoon and good evening. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Elspeth Chapman and I'm the Strategic Partnership and Advocacy Specialist with the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Um, before we start, um, I would just like to flag that this session is available in multiple languages. It's available in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. So to utilize the interpretation function in Zoom, you can click the globe icon um, at the bottom of your Zoom panel and select the language you prefer um, to, to listen in. Um, and I think with that, um, we can get started. So we would like to wish you all a very warm welcome to the launch event of the research study, What Will Happen to Our Children? When schools around the world close their doors as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have major concerns on the impact this would have on all children, but especially those living in some of the most fragile humanitarian contexts. The participatory action research study was conducted in Colombia, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Lebanon to dive deeper into the impacts of these school closures on children already affected by compounding humanitarian crises and hear firsthand from children, from young people and their families about their experiences and recommendations. As you can see uh, from this event, it is truly a multi-stakeholder collaboration. The project was commissioned by the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action in collaboration with the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies. It was led by Protecnon Foundation for Innovation and Learning with generous funding from Porticus, UNICEF, and the United States Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. We are delighted to have the Elevate Children Funders Group and the International Education Funders Group co-sponsor today's launch event. And we thank them for their support and their engagement in this important research project. So before I hand over to our first speaker, and if we can move to the next slide, I would like to give a very quick overview of our PACT program today. So Duarte Luton from Portugal, from Portugal will give opening remarks, followed by a presentation of the study's key finding and recommendations by Protecnon and the three research partners, SINBE, the International Center for Education and Human Development Foundation in Colombia, BFID, the Office of Information Training, Exchange and Research for Development in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Dr. Basil Akar and his team from the Notre Dame University in Lebanon. We will then have time for a short Q&A. For the second panel, which will be led by Dean Brooks from the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, we are absolutely thrilled to be joined here today by Eddie Dutton from Education Cannot Wait, Dr. Aisha Kadir from Save the Children UK, and Kelly Lower from the United States Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. Our expert panelists will share their reflections from health, education, and child protection perspectives on how we can collectively take forward the recommendations stemming from this report. We will then have a second Q&A, followed by closing remarks from Laura Savage from the International Education Funders Group and Heather Hamilton from the Elevate Children Funders Group. So as you can see, a very multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, please don't wait until the Q&A to ask questions. You can type these in the chat box at any time, uh, and we will aim to answer as many as possible during the Q&A sessions. Uh, give it to the limited time. If possible, we encourage our panelists and speakers to answer direct questions directly in the chat, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, please feel free to also share any reflections, thoughts, and ideas in the chat box during mm -hmm. the event, because we really want to hear from you as much as possible. Finally, I would like to just thank you all for joining us today. Those of um, those of you joining the events directly and those of you joining through the Alliance's annual meeting for child protection and humanitarian action. The presentation of this report and its recommendations are only the beginning of our journey. We really look forward to hearing from you and working together to ensure that in current and future infectious disease outbreaks, children in humanitarian settings are not left behind. And with this, I would now like to hand over to our first speaker, Dewerke Luton, Global Grants Manager from Porticus. Thank you. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dewerke Luton, and as a Global Grant Manager for Porticus, I'm really honored to be with you today for the launch of this important research. 
COVID-19 school closures affected all of us as practitioners, as caregivers, and as students. The closures of education facilities were affecting the overall majority of the world student population, including students in Unitarian settings. In some countries, education facilities have still not fully opened. School closures were used as a measure to contain the spread of the coronavirus. But as we expected, and unfortunately now know, they amplified existing education inequalities and inequities and exposed children to protection risks. Children that were already vulnerable, for example, due to disability or displacement status, were hit hardest. So how did this research come about? The Alliance and INEE have been working together for the past five years to promote more systematic collaboration in unitarian settings. By bringing the sectors together, it is easier to promote the holistic needs of children and their well-being. Because of course, education is protective and protection directly contributes to education outcomes. This collaboration between INE and the Alliance has resulted in a multi-agency advisory group in products to guide the practical integration, such as a position paper and a guidance pack for practitioners in the field, COVID-19 response materials, as well as research. So the research that we're all here today for builds on a policy brief that was developed by the Alliance, INEE and Protechnon called Weighing Up the Risks, as well as an evidence synthesis on the impact of school closures on children's protection and well-being. This research actually aims to tackle an evidence gap and gathers the perspectives of people that are often overlooked, namely children and youth themselves, caregivers, teachers, and communities that are directly affected by school closures in humanitarian settings. The participatory research documents the experiences of people in Colombia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and in Lebanon that were impacted by school closures. In order to better understand how, how school closures are impacting education inequalities and child protection outcomes in humanitarian settings, and to help policymakers put the needs of children first in case of future infectious disease outbreaks. At Porticus, we strongly believe in meaningful participation of people in matters that affect them the most, and that the holistic needs of children should be the primary point of departure for how humanitarian services are delivered. This research and the recommendations embody these beliefs. I really hope that this research will help governments, humanitarian agencies, and other actors to give a central role to children's perspectives and their well being in making sure that they are at the center of decision making in case of infectious disease outbreaks in humanitarian settings. Unfortunately, COVID 19 is not over. And it's also unlikely to be the last disease outbreak. So before I'm handing it over to Laura, I would like to thank the children, caregivers, communities that shared their perspectives and helped to draft the recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dewerka, for your words of introduction. My name is Laura Lee, a senior associate and researcher at Protecton Foundation uh, for Innovation and Learning. Um, please show the, the slides. Thank you. Our global research team has been working on this project with children and families and communities and global actors for over a year and a half. What will happen to our children is a question from a Syrian father in Lebanon concerned about whether his children would ever study again and what their future might hold. This project has sought to explore the views and experiences of children, families and communities of support in humanitarian settings across the three countries. Next slide, please. Today, I'm joined by uh, fellow researchers at Protechnon, Tim Williams and Kirsten Pontalti, and our research partners from Lebanon, Colombia, and Democratic Republic of Congo uh, to provide an overview of the research, presenting key findings and recommendations from each country as well as across contexts. Our partners co developed the methodology, implemented and analyzed the research, and are leading the national advocacy processes with the advocacy advisory groups. Dr. Basil Akar and his team from Notre Dame University led our team in Lebanon. Today, Zarig Kul Sahagian, a researcher in the project, is joining us from Beirut to present. In Colombia, Cindy carried out the research. Andreas Felipe Ospina from Cindy will be sharing with us. And Jonas Habimana joins us today from Democratic Republic of Congo to represent 
the research team at BFED. A reminder, you can include messages in the chat box throughout the presentation as this will be followed by a short Q&A. I'll now pass the microphone to Tim Williams to introduce the research. Thanks so much, Laura. <clears throat> so we know already that school closures during COVID impacted uh, almost 1.6 billion learners. And most governments responded um, by introducing remote learning. Unfortunately, many children lack the ability to connect. And children in humanitarian settings were often among the most marginalized during this time. School closures amplified existing issues around access and learning. Uh, they also distanced children off from protective services. And we found that in the, our countries under study, um, most children experienced school closures well into the, the current year, 2022. Next slide, please. So our study set out to um, address the following overarching question. And that is what education inequalities, child protection risk and protective factors and adverse out outcomes have been amplified as a result of COVID uh, school closures in humanitarian contexts. And the purpose of this work was really to ensure that children's perspectives and their holistic well-being were at the center of decision-making and planning processes in infectious disease outbreaks within humanitarian settings, uh, particularly when it comes to school closures and school reopenings as well. And as other speakers have mentioned, we, we did this study um, with uh, direct field work um, in the DRC, Lebanon, and Colombia. Next study, please. Or next slide, please. Uh, so to do this work, we worked with research partners um, in each of the three countries um, to co-develop the data collection tools and carry out research in between two to four field sites in each country, engaging in a total of over 700 participants. Um, and more than 300 of these uh, were children. Um, children range from primary and secondary school age students um, to out of school youth as well. Uh, the adult participants we spoke with included caregivers, educators, social service workers, um, as well as uh, key informant interviews at the, the global setting or the, the global scale, um, national level, um, as well as subnational levels. Um, and the methods we used um, included interviews and group discussions, and as well as participatory methods. In this slide, you'll see um, some examples of the types of participatory methods we used. Um, on the, the top slide or the top photo shows a river timeline, which allowed children to depict some of the challenges and opportunities they encountered before and during COVID, um, as represented by uh, rocks that uh, kind of uh, uh, were meant to show some of the, the challenges that children faced um, during the, these time periods. Uh, the picture below shows the, the Garden of Life, um, which allowed children to illustrate some of the challenges they faced through um, thorns. Um, the flowers that they um, experienced as opportunities, as well as the sun and the rain um, that uh, were represented some of those um, uh, individuals or groups that supported children during this time. And it's also important to, to note that during this process, uh, uh, we had research partners um, that set up advocacy advisory groups um, at, the, at the outset of the project to ensure that uh, this research was done in a way um, that the recommendations put forth at the, the national level um, could be acted upon in a meaningful way. Uh, with that said, I'll turn it over to my um, colleague, Kirsten Pontalki, who will discuss the key findings from this work. Great, thanks, Tim. And hi, all. Thank you for joining us today. The key findings uh, correspond to the study's five research sub-questions. The first finding we had was that school closures and remote learning combined to cause a significant increase in adverse protection outcomes for children by compounding existing risks and creating new ones. Protection risks increased in part because school closures pressured children's communities of care, from their parents to their teachers and community leaders and organizations. This made individuals and groups less capable of supporting children. It also made communities less safe. Children in the study experienced a loss of relationships and recreation, and as well as increases in mental health challenges, child abuse, exploitation, violence, neglect, ad adolescent pregnancy and early marriage, child labor and worst forms of labor, including recruitment to armed groups. The children who were most likely to face increases in risks and adverse outcomes 
were the children who were vulnerable before the pandemic, especially children with disabilities and children from marginalized groups within each country and setting. The second finding was that there were many strategies and actions that children, families, and communities employed to cope and feel well. Children said they learned new hobbies, laughed, screamed outside, played sports and games, helped others, spent time with family, and followed COVID-19 protocols to keep themselves and others safe. When children lost school relationships, some of them responded by investing more in uh, proximal relationships, particularly with immediate family and neighbors. But while these efforts helped to mitigate the negative impacts of school closures on child well-being, children, parents, teachers, community leaders all said that they needed far more external support and resources than what they had. Next slide. The third finding was that school closures and remote learning approaches increase adverse learning outcomes. In the study context, governments and education actors closed schools and made efforts to roll out remote learning approaches. However, very few children in the study communities could access or benefit from remote learning of any kind. Efforts were impeded by a lack of policy implementation, material support to schools and students, access to the internet and devices needed for learning, access to electricity, as well as low, sorry, low digital literacy and a lack of learning support among other factors. The responsibility to self-guide learning was an enormous stress for children and parents. School closures and remote learning contributed to significant lost learning, one to two years in most cases. It also contributed to a lack of progression in learning, developmental regression, especially for young children and children with disabilities, a loss of investment and hope in schooling and school dropout. The fourth finding was that school closures and remote learning amplify and create educational inequalities, but they also increase broader inequalities that affect learning. Together, these inequalities negatively impacted children's access to education, as well as their ability to learn. For example, students with siblings had to share any available resources. Sometimes the eldest child or sons were prioritized over others. Finally, the fifth finding was that school closures made it far more difficult for the social service workforce to do their job of preventing harm and responding to children's protection needs. By social service workforce, I'm referring to, for example, social workers, school counselors and support staff. Social service workers adapted ways of identifying and following up on cases, but this was almost always done outside of any formal child protection system. Thank you. We're going to now hear from our partners. Thank you, Kirsten. The research in Lebanon was carried out in two sites and data was collected from Syrian and Palestinian refugees and low income Lebanese families. Next slide, please. Moving to our research key findings, in Lebanon, COVID-19 related school closures were accompanied by a number of compounding crises, which amplified the adverse protection outcomes for children's communities of care. These communities were struggling as the national economy was collapsing. Shortly after the closures, they were hit with the Beirut port blast. Supplies of electricity, fuel, food and medicine were increasingly unstable and expensive. Amidst all this, there was limited evidence of education and protection strategies or planning to respond to the closures. Adverse outcomes for children include, next slide please, an increase in domestic responsibilities, Violence, abuse, neglect, and abandonment were increased as well due to parental stress, anxiety, and burnout. Mothers in Lebanon complained that school closures and the weight of remote learning negatively impacted children's right to play. 
School closures also compounded the effect of the economic crisis in the country to the point that child labor was almost normalized. Finally, with children out of school, early marriage was a way for parents to secure their daughter's future and relieve a household's economic stress. Next slide, please. Remote learning was accompanied with many challenges. The participants reported that synchronous remote teaching was rarely taking place due to a lack of equipment, internet, and electricity outages. Compounding these challenges, digital literacy was very low among teachers, parents, and the students, due to which online classes took longer to facilitate. These challenges led to adverse learning outcomes, such as lack of learning and lost learning, because the pace of online learning was too fast. Another adverse learning outcome was the automatic promotion of students to the next grade level, because teachers did not have tools for assessing students remotely. Finally, dropout rates were increased in the context of the study because parents could not afford sending their children back to school. Next slide, please. Based on the findings, we recommend the following. Schools and municipalities can develop their own contingency or emergency response plans in case of another infectious disease outbreak or other emergency that could lead to school closures. The committees would need to comprise children parents and teachers. They would also need guidance on how to develop emergency response plans. Many families and NGOs are unaware of the existing social service system, particularly the child protection system at the Ministry of Education and Higher Education and the Ministry of Social Affairs. Outreach is critical for people to understand what services are available and how to access them. Finally, most of the teachers in Lebanon do not hold written qualifications to teach. Also, many parents and teachers struggle with degrees of fatigue and burnout, despite their resilience to the compounded crisis. Raising awareness of key concepts in learning and education, risk factors and child protection may help them make more informed decisions. And now I'll hand over to Andreas. Thank you. Thank you, Zagig. Well, um, in Colombia, this study was implemented by Fundación Centro Internacional de Educación y Desarrollo Humano, seen in Spanish, with support from World Vision and the Norwegian uh, Refugee Council between September and December 2021 in Condinamarca and Cover Regional. Additionally, the Norwegian a refugee Council conducted questionnaires with children, parents, educators, and social savers workers in Ocaña, Norte, Santander, and Santa Marta. Next slide. Uh, the, main the main findings in Colombia indicate that the lack of socialization and play being confined in small places with family, fear of contagion, and the burden of domestic and academic work generated mental health challenges in children, as well as family members um, and teachers. Also, several child suicide attempts or cases were also contribu contributed uh, uh, to mental health challenges related to school closures. Next one. Uh, students and students lost contact with school uh, friends and teacher support. This loss was felt acutely by children with difficult home lives and mental health challenges. For many students and children, the school closures and confinement contributed to the emergence or resurgence of interfamily violence and conflict. Uh, parents who had to go out to work risked neglecting their children at home. Parents struggled to meet children's basic needs due to added cost during school closure and economic precarity related to the pandemic. During the school closure, some children reportedly left uh, learning to work. In Ocaña, Norte Santander and Santa Marta, recruitment to armed groups increased during school closures. Next slide, please. 
children and young people recognize that virtual learning processes are not as effective as face-to-face -face classes. The students lost learning found it difficult to progress. It was not uncommon for younger students and children with disabilities to experience de uh, developmental regression, dropout rates increased. Uh, students stated that problems caused by distance learning, for example, lost learning and socialization skills are still negatively affecting their learning since returning to school. Teaching staff and institutions try to address some of the negative effects of school closure by adapting their uh, teaching to remote methods, especially using WhatsApp and solitizing donations of internet devices and using cards for students. However, their efforts were not equal to the demands of remote learning. Additional, most of students did not have adequate or any access to the internet or cellular reception, learning devices or phones. Some children had less access to learning and were particularly disadvantaged by remote, learnings, remote learning, especially children with disabilities and special education needs, children who weren't internally displaced or migrants, especially Venezuelans, children living in rural and borderline areas. The students who had to share devices with siblings and parents and the siblings who had to take care of and instruct younger siblings. Next slide, please. Also, there was some evidence of positive coping mechanisms, opportunities and action during school closures, such as families and education institutions recognizing the importance of having multiple actors and sectors contribute to children and young people growth and development. Also, we found that children learning new hobbies and helping others to prevent boredom and depression. Also, increased coordination and cooperation between families and schools. Neighbors and tutoring each other, children and sharing Wi-Fi and devices. Digital literacy training that school developed with the participation of family and caregivers. In some cases, school um, uh, uh, teachers adapted to remote learning by adapting in class content and innovating pedagogical practices. In some cases, school closures and confinement generated greater family unity with children becoming much closer to their parents, caregiving, and siblings. Cut off from school peers, many became closer to school in their online classes immediate neighborhood. With this, I hand it over to Jonas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can see here the research conducted at a level in DRC. The, these are two sites as, um, where conflicts are currently occurring. Next slide. This research was conducted in a complex environment. We are here in a difficult uh, com context. So in this area, we've seen a compounding crisis in the North Kivu province. We have to mention, of course, uh, COVID uh, related to school closures, but also Ebola virus cases. In 2021, there was also a, a volcanic eruption and an ongoing conflict, armed conflict, and some of the research sites included, therefore, poverty. As we know that this area is a, uh, in accordance to World Bank, one of the poorest regions uh, in the DRC. Next slide. The result of our uh, research. The key findings are the following. Children have experienced multiple and heavy uh, school closures due to COVID-19 causing disruption to their learning, increasing also the number of school failures. We've also uh, noticed that many were the children not able to return to school. Many children actually even sometimes left and crossed the border to go and find work in Uganda. Therefore, 
we've also seen that most uh, schools did not have PPEs, including masks and uh, hand washing uh, gel. Next slide. Feedback from the children. Based on our research, we've uh, noticed that before school closures, the children were feeling, uh, were, were happy. But following school closures, they realized that there was a lot of uh, early marriages. We've also observed that when the schools reopened, we had less students in schools. During school closures, following COVID-19, we've seen an increase in uh, child sexual abuse and exploitation cases. We've seen also child labor, including the worst forms of labor, carrying very heavy burdens, working in factories, and we've also seen a social isolation for children. Before children were able to meet their friends, going to the church, but that wasn't possible anymore. So there's a strong social isolation. Recommendations from TRC. First of all, for the we would like to recommend to global protection and education clusters and supporting humanitarian agencies and networks to continue to mobilize funds to support education and child protection in Congo, to be able to mobilize additional means to protect children in DRC. And we should have an integrated programming approach, including P PSS, WASH, food security. And I believe the government should also be more active and integrate a 5% of the state budget for emergency management to prioritize children's education. I believe this should be a top priority for the government and taking into account the well-being of children during school closures due to pandemic. I believe also that there is more investment needed in child-centered IDO preparedness. This could be related to different infectious disease and I believe that uh, children-centered activities should be developed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. And um, I'll now present uh, some of the overarching recommendations. Please show the slides again. Thank you. Um, as one Syrian mother expressed, the simplest right for a child is education. It was not provided properly during the pandemic. Next slide. The closure of schools due to COVID-19 made the structural and systemic inequalities that affect vulnerable children and young people in humanitarian settings more visible and much worse. Protracted school closures and challenges related to remote learning were compounded by the secondary effects of the pandemic, such as job loss, food insecurity, and economic challenges. Although schools have returned to in-person learning, the negative impacts of school closures and remote learning for example, dropout, child marriage, learning loss, um, have not been resolved. Children, especially those identified as most affected by school closures, need additional support to overcome the limitations and shortcomings that remain. There's an urgent need to support children and families most impacted by COVID-19 related school closures and to develop policies and guidance to support child-centered infectious disease related school closure decisions and holistic child well-being and protection during and after infectious disease outbreaks in humanitarian settings. Next slide. The overarching recommendations for government, humanitarian coordination structures, bodies, humanitarian agencies, and other decision makers include the following. It's recommended that schools only are closed in the most extreme of circumstances when all other options have been exhausted. Secondly, it's recommended that evidence is used to strengthen child-centered infectious disease outbreak preparedness related to education and child protection. Thirdly, accountability needs to be assured to children, families, and communities through transparent feedback mechanisms that are built into local governance, decision-making structures, and shared decision-making in planning and implementing IDO emergency response efforts. 
an intersectoral integrated response is required to support children and families most severely impacted by COVID-19 to ensure that children are placed at the center of decision-making in the future. It's important to support actions being taken by children, families, and communities to strengthen their well-being and curb the impacts of school closures. Meaningful opportunities need to be created for children, families, and communities, as well as educators, social service workers, to be engaged in developing response plans and planning and preparing and implementing future responses. Finally, we want to emphasize that the recommendations to be taken by governments, humanitarian organizations, and other actors are outlined in the two reports being launched today. Um, next slide, and again. And here are the two reports that are being launched today. If you click again, thank you. Um, one focused on uh, social service workforce and a broader one highlighting the impact of COVID-19 school closures on the child protection and education inequalities in the three contexts. Next slide. Finally, we as a research team and with the Alliance and the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies are grateful to the funders, Porticus, UNICEF, and the United States Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. We're incredibly grateful to the children and young people, parents and caregivers, education and protection actors, policymakers, and others who shared their insights and experiences with us so that we can better understand how school closures impacted young people in humanitarian settings and we can better understand how we can do better collectively. I'll now pass it to our last slide and I'll pass it back to Elspeth. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for, for this presentation and for sharing some of these findings. Um, the report is very rich. I've been uh, privileged to see it before it has been, been uh, released and to be involved in the process, but it was now online and we will share the links. So we really encourage you to read it and you can read about this much more. I can see the chat has been quite active and we've had some great questions. Um, maybe we can just recap a couple of those quickly for those who have not been following um, the chat and listening at the same time. So I think um, a couple of the key questions that came up, and I think any of the panelists um, uh, presenters can answer this. One is um, what learnings can we extract from this uh, re related to the challenges of remote learning for other humanitarian contexts? Uh, where remote learning is being implemented and being and being and being set up. So that's one question. And then I think a second one that we can just, it would be interesting to hear uh, are some of the similarities and differences that really struck you uh, between the uh, three different contexts uh, in the study. And I don't know if anyone would like to volunteer themselves or if Laura or Kristen would like to take the question. I think what one of the things that was quite striking, and I said this in the chat, was that there were really strong similarities across very different contexts. And I, it was interesting in analyzing the data that initially our focus was on, oh, okay, what worked and didn't work about remote learning. But when we took a step back in the analysis, we realized that actually most of the children in these contexts didn't even have access to any of the remote um, learning modalities. So whether it was um, the, the Syrian refugee children in uh, Lebanon in camps or children in rural DRC in North Kivu, or particularly in Colombia, children in the borderlands, they just didn't have access really. And if they did, it was intermittent. So that was a really strong similarity. I'll let somebody from one of our national partners maybe outline some of the differences. Um, perhaps we can welcome um, Jonas to explain uh, some of the things that were specific to uh, DRC. Thank you very much. When it comes to the differences, I believe that in a DRC, we are in a very uh, complex uh, context. Of course, uh, armed uh, conflicts are a real problem here in North Kivu. And uh, we talked about uh, COVID-19, but we also have Ebola here in uh, our region. We also had a, a volcanic eruption impacting millions of people. Therefore, all these uh, are challenges and had an impact on school closures. 
But talking about uh, the commonalities, it's true that when I look also at the number of children uh, here, who, the increase in the number of early marriages, early pregnancies, I think we should also mention that as a commonality. So I believe those are uh, commonalities, even if there are differences. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jonas, for, for, sharing, for sharing with us all. Um, I think just looking at time, um, I think we'll move on, but please keep writing your questions and comments in the chat box as we go along. Um, so actually now we had a little um, interactive um, uh, segment for you. So we're going to ask you all a question. Um, so you'll see a, a link um, in the chat box. Um, and the question is, so the, the recommendations stemming from the report. So you heard Laura presents to us the key recommendations. Um, who do you think is responsible for acting on these recommendations? So you can see here the options and please tick all that apply. So I just give you a couple of moments now to complete the Mentilita meter. If you go to the link that's in the chat box, we have a few replies coming through to so the options. We have humanitarian leadership and humanitarian coordination bodies, UN agencies and INGOs, national governments, local and community-based organization. Uh, okay, I think the option, you can only choose one, but anyway, choose your top, choose your top, um, think has the most responsibility. Okay, great. So Ali, keep uh, putting your thoughts there. There is actually no correct answer here. So you'll actually see um, when you read the full report um, that it's really a collective responsibility. Um, and the recommendations in, in the report have actually been classified by different stakeholder groups. And you'll see the interconnected nature of the recommendations across the different group, groups um, and, the, and the kind of key role that, that we can all play across these different, um, across the different um, groups that were shown. So it was just an exercise to get us thinking, but as someone has mentioned, as Susanna has mentioned in the chat, it's a shared responsibility. So I think with that, we can, um, we can uh, now hand over to um, Dean Brooks, the director of the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, who will be leading the next panel. So thank you, Dean. Thank you, Elspeth. I'm just so excited about this work. Thank you to Protocon and everybody that has contributed. This, as you said, has been you know, such an undertaking and I just remember so many emails and calls. It's like, it's still going on. <laughs> it's, it's incredible work and it's telling us so much. And you know, just seeing the comments here, um, excellent points of contacting WHO, um, you know, and continuing to build on this work. I know we have advocacy plans with the partners. Jonas, so good to see you there and hear from you. Um, so yeah, I think we should just jump right into the, to the next panel. Um, but it's it's really an honor to be here with all of you. I'm sorry, Han, he's not able to join us, um, but hoping he's feeling better soon. And um, yeah, just great work and a tool that all of us can use to really advocate. So let's jump in um, and I'm gonna follow, I have, they've given me a plan because everybody's so well organized. So let me pull up my plan and we're going to get started with some questions um, for our three panelists. So um, we have on this panel, uh, Eddie Dutton, uh, who's the emergency manager for Education Cannot Wait. Very happy to have him here. And actually, for those of you who don't know, we're actually sitting in the same office. So we're, we're going to take turns talking. <laughs> um, we also have Kelly Lower from the, uh, here as the program officer from the U.S. Department of State, Bureau for Population, Refugees, and Migration. Great to have you here, Kelly. And Dr. Aisha Kadir, very happy to meet you and so happy to have uh, the humanitarian health perspective here. And uh, Dr. Aisha mm -hmm. is the Senior Humanitarian Health Lead at Save the Children UK. So with this, uh, Eddie, 
who's on the other side of the desk. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with you, and I'll put myself on mute so we don't have an echo here in the room. Um, but Eddie, there has been a long history of collaboration between education and child protection sectors. So how can we build upon this collaboration to be better prepared to respond to and mitigate the risks of future infectious disease outbreak related school closures on children's protection and well-being? So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Eddie, thank you. Great, thank, thank you very much, Dean. And, and uh, thank you all for allowing Education Cannot Wait a few minutes to participate on this panel and, and share some of our, our thoughts and reflections with you. Um, for those of you who don't know Education Cannot Wait, let me just say one word and then I'll direct you to our website, educationcannotwait.org to learn a little bit more. But we are uh, an education and emergencies fund where we work to prioritize more funding for education and ensuring that education is prioritized at the onset of a crisis. And certainly that education is prioritized in protracted situations as well. I believe I only have three minutes per question. So I'm not gonna go into our COVID-19 response, um, but perhaps I'll try to weave a little bit of that into, into some of our responses. But I think this is a great question to start with because um, that's right. I mean, there is strong collaboration between education and, and child protection. Of course, we see that at the, the global level, but also at the country level. The INE minimum standards uh, promote that. We have the CP minimum standards. The Alliance strategic pillar number uh, three, I think it is, uh, highlights this. And of course, we have the CP uh, EIE framework as well. Uh, so there is a, a lot of collaboration and ECW likes to build on this and designing its, its programmings. Uh, but let me, let me speak a little bit to this. I mean, unfortunately, as was mentioned, I think in one of the opening remarks, it is likely that we will expect to see some type of interruption to learning again. Uh, hopefully not to the same extent, but perhaps again at a global scale. So, I think there are a lot of learnings that we can apply both within this and then in the next question I'll, I'll address later when it comes to involvement with national governments. Um, I think the first point is that uh, we know that children do not experience life in silos. And I think it's important that our responses and our re plans don't mimic that as well. We often talk about there is a CP response and an education response. And I think often what we are seeing now is that there is a need to look at how we are harmonizing that, speaking as one and programming together to address that in a, in a holistic way. Uh, and so it's critical when we're looking at designing response plans, uh, supporting government with responding, that education and CP actors are continuing to collaborate uh, in designing, implementing, and, and monitoring programs. Often ECW is working in extremely uh, challenging environments where perhaps there isn't a lot of government engagement as well. And so we do look to the humanitarian community to often take a leadership role there. So it's quite critical that they're collaborating together. What I, what I found useful, uh, and, and you know, if you look at the, um, the Alliance website, of course you have these school reopening guidance notes. And that's an interesting and, and a great example of collaboration. It's simple, it's effective, it's to the point and it brings together both of these pieces. And I think that's an interesting framing to look at how we can also collaborate together in the future, perhaps not just for reopening, but how to address such challenges uh, in the future. I think COVID has also challenged us to think a little bit differently. I, I work a lot with Bangladesh. Uh, I was there in 2018 and 19, but also kind of follow Bangladesh for ECW now. And what we saw during COVID is that education became a non-essential uh, service, basically. Education actors could not enter the camps. School learning spaces were closed. Only CP actors and health actors could actually access the camps. Uh, and what that challenged us to do is think a little bit differently about then how are we looking at continuing education through non-education actors using CP and health actors to not just follow up on learning, maybe providing materials, but also doing those important well-being checks, health checks, and, and using it as an opportunity. So it's important as we're looking in the future that we look at those kind of contingency arrangements. What happens in those really challenging environments where, uh, where we need to rely on non-education actors to also support um, education programming? 
What we also saw during COVID, and I, I think it's an interesting collaboration as well, we saw this perhaps also in Bangladesh, um, is that uh, there are a lot of integrated solutions. So, um, and I'll speak to this in the next question, but often low tech and no tech solutions are, are the best way to, you know, to continue providing learning opportunity. And there's ways that you can use a simple mobile phone when you're checking in with a student to also ask some other questions about their well being, ask what's going on in the home environment if it's possible, and using that as a, as a check uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, children are still. In a, in a safe environment. We, we heard about some of those challenges and especially in the Lebanon presentation, I believe it was. Um, and for, uh, I think maybe a, um, a final point and I'll stop here, um, is around joint advocacy uh, to donors to ensure that uh, they also promote close collaboration in our programming that they fund. Uh, ECW is a donor, but we also develop programs ourselves and work with other donors too. Uh, and I, I think it's quite critical that um, our donors are uh, placing responsibility in ensuring this collaboration as well. And that then we reduce competition between sectors. We're able to provide more funding for everyone. And we're actually able to look at uh, meaningful interventions for children uh, that, that can be delivered over time. Perhaps, yeah. perhaps I'll stop there, Dean. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, on my side, I got to hear Eddie twice because I had a little bit of echo. So. It's really uh, good points, excellent points on the harmonizing, the collaboration that's required. Um, and, uh, and definitely ECW has supported our collaboration as well um, between the Alliance and INEE. Um, and speaking of advocacy to donors, I, we're gonna go to a donor soon. <laughs> Kelly, so good to see you. And thank you for joining this panel today. Um, and we have a question for you. Um, which is really building on what uh, we just heard from Eddie, which is what is the role that bilateral donors can play in helping governments and humanitarian actors better balance the health consideration in an infectious disease outbreak with the negative impact of school closures on both education and the protection of children. And as you're um, responding, if you could also comment about the differential impact uh, of such closures on girls, boys, young people, you know, of different ages. So Kelly, over to you, thank you. Great, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm really pleased to be able to join and, and represent my fellow donors as well. You know, governments and humanitarian actors are facing a really difficult task of trying to balance health considerations in, you know, an outbreak with the negative impact of school closures on education and protection of children. You know, as the research indicates, the impact of school closures have been particularly acute for the world's most vulnerable children, and that these negative repercussions of closing schools are going to expand, extend way beyond just the loss of learning. You know, COVID-19 revealed the extent to which schools provide more than just educational services. Schools provide invaluable social and emotional support, including meaningful relationships with teachers and their peers. There's resources for coping mechanisms and mechanisms for protective structures, such as various social services as an entree point to get to those services. The absence of these child protection services resulted in severe consequences for child well-being. We saw that across all of these incidences in the research. So for instance, as noted, you know, children experienced increases in child exploitation, abuse, adolescent pregnancy, early marriage, child labor all of the negative coping mechanisms that we're tracking within the child protection space. And while broadly detrimental, school's closures differentially impacted children of different ages and different genders. So for example, and as highlighted in the, in the presentation just before, older students with younger siblings became responsible not only for their own learning, but also now the learning of their younger siblings and the caregiving responsibility of others. Uh, as one in one study site, you know, older students had not progressed were also hesitant to return as they were now beyond the age um, that they should be for their grade level, which is something that we consistently see across, across the board within refugee education and things like that, of this out of sync with the ages. Uganda presents really the most clear impact on adolescent girls. Uh, with the longest school closure, we're also seeing the rate of adolescent pregnancy has skyrocketed across the country. And this is gonna impact these girls in their education careers, but also their communities for decades to come. The detrimental impacts on the well being of children highlight the importance of child protection and classrooms as a safe space for children to grow and develop. 
We've come a long way in supporting the interconnectedness between child protection and education, but now it's really essential that we ensure that these developments are not lost when new emergencies or infectious disease outbreaks occur. And donors have an essential and critical role to play. We have to hold our partners accountable, we need to hold ourselves accountable, and we need to make sure that the broader humanitarian response is planned to and consider the, the holistic needs of children um, and that these are considered essential from the very start. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kelly. I appreciate uh, your comments. And we're going to move over um, to Dr. Aisha um, Kadir, and i um, really happy you could also join. Um, so how can we better support then the health actors to take into consideration the holistic well-being and protection needs of children in humanitarian settings during infectious disease outbreaks and in child-centered decision-making regarding school closures. Over to you, doctor. Well, you know, I think um, the first thing to think about when we're thinking about health and child health is that, I, and I say this as a pediatrician, but I wish the roads were paved with humanitarian pediatricians, but they're, they're not. So when we think about who's working in health and who uh, who's doing a humanitarian response, who's implementing a humanitarian response and who's designing it, who's paying for it, um, we need to think about uh, what their understanding of children is and what their expectation of children's roles in society and what their expectation of adaptation. Um, very often, historically, we've had kind of a trickle down approach to if we do humanitarian response more generally, then whatever benefits adults will hopefully then help the children. Um, and this isn't good enough. And it's not good enough for many reasons. I don't have enough time to talk about it here, but I think um, we need to take a step back and think, right, okay, we've got health workers. We've also got education, which is critical for child health and development. And actually humanitarian education teams are often the ones who are doing the child public health, early child development work. They're, they're child public health actors um, and they're doing extremely important work that protects children later on. And we need to recognize that as a kind of a health, a public health intervention. So if we want to help health actors to work, uh, to work together with, uh, well, if we wanna help them to take a more holistic approach, we need to work together with them. Um, the child protection and education need to, to really, and not just in terms of working in the same place, but with the same populations, we need to make sure that uh, our needs assessments are integrated, that we also have integrated indicators so we can actually measure the outcomes from this holistic or, or multi-sector approach. And that'll help us to understand um, not, only what the needs are, not only what the needs are, but also we can then begin to understand more about the, um, the impact that we're having um, and we can help to design an intervention that actually that will even if it's just a health or perhaps and hopefully an integrated health protection education intervention that it'll actually have impacts on these other sectors we need to recognize these these impacts are already occurring but then we need to look at them more carefully part of the issue also for health is that we um people like when we do needs assessments, education assessments and protection assessments are very frequently are sort of a, a, a sort of a fundamental aspect of that is to include the perceptions of children. This is not happening in health. Um, and it's not happening in health because people don't have the skills to be able to do that safely or effectively. Talking to children is a skill. Um, not everyone is a pediatrician, not everyone is a child Nurse, nurse, not everyone is a child protection specialist. Not anyone is working in some aspect of education with children. And we need to recognize that and we need to help either scale up that capacity or to help actors to, uh, to help actors to, to support them to do this and to, to help them to prioritize it. Because no, we don't want to ask a five-year-old how to you know, diagnose an illness, but we do want to know what is important to that five-year-old, um, because if we understand the priorities of the child, of children in a community, then we can actually understand how to focus our interventions. And we, we are always limited in our resources and what we can do in humanitarian response. So we have to make priorities and those priorities 
absolutely should reflect the priorities of children because they, they actually have a kind of wisdom. They distill out what's most important. And if we are wanting to help them, we need to recognize that they're active participants in their lives. Um, they have thoughts about what's happening to them. And they, they, what we do as a humanitarian sector in an intervention, they have thoughts about this as well and how they interact with what's happening to them and also humanitarian actors um, will, will be very much related to what they think about it and, and how they feel about it. So we, we need to work together with them, but we need people who can do that safely and effectively. Um, and that's not quite, we're not quite there yet. Um, and I realize we've gone over time. I could go on about this for hours, but I just wanted to stop here because I think those are sort of the main things I wanted to say. Oh, no, thank you so much. Um, I just want to encourage uh, the 108 people on, on, this, uh, on this webinar to take a moment and add your questions. Um, and then I'd like to actually invite our panelists. Um, I know we were going to talk it through some questions, but in the interest of time, to just give you a, a final word um, and maybe if you could actually share with us um, um, perhaps, you know, how you think we could take these recommendations forward. If you have any advice on that or anything from some of your, your own preparations uh, that you would like to, to share back with the audience. So I'll first hand over to Eddie and then we'll come back around to Kelly and, and Dr. Aisha, okay? Thanks so much, Dean. Um, tricky question to do first, um, but uh, let me take a stab at it. No, I, I mean, I think the first, you know, the solution is, is keeping a dialogue open. I think what COVID told us, is, I mean, taught us is that we had a lot of preconceived ideas of what to do, and a lot of that failed. Um, we could not go to scale nationwide. International actors could not access communities, perhaps couldn't even access um, countries. Um, systems that are built around um, international actors may not be the most appropriate solution in the long term. Now, of course, we know there are a lot of con uh, contexts where children uh, cannot be reached by government, and I think we need to be keeping that in mind as well. Uh, but ultimately, we have to, we have to support uh, those who have that shared responsibility to be able to, to reach um, um, all children in an equitable way uh, based on their differentiated needs. And I, I think a final point perhaps here is that, um, uh, and it was mentioned uh, in one of the presentations, uh, there is often the tendency to look to tech solutions or to look to something that we can, we can hand out. Um, I think we have a shared responsibility when we're working with governments and communities that we're not also pushing things onto them that are not sustainable, not scalable, and not linked to their curricula and their teacher capacities, their examination systems, and not something that can be um, uh, can benefit everyone. And so there is a shared responsibility there that we are we are not just promoting the easiest solution, but perhaps the one that uh, uh, is best fit for the context. But thank you again so much for the opportunity to uh, to share some thoughts with the group. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. I'm handing over to Kelly, please. Yeah, and you know, just to build a little bit off of what Eddie had just noted, I, I agree. I think the number one lesson that has come about is really understanding uh, what individuals need and figuring out how best to meet them where they are. I think, um, you know, the child participation, and I'm seeing great comments in the chat as well, of, you know, really emphasizing child participation and parents and caregivers participation as well. This is not just a situation for humanitarian settings, right? This is all over the world in our communities everywhere, you know, understanding sort of what these decisions have this, you know, trickle down effect is, is really, really impactful. And, and the burden in this context is really being placed on children and their families. And so trying to think through how can we more effectively um, understand and, and respond better to that. I think a key actor here that we've all seen as, you know, truly the most impactful are the local organizations that still maintained access, that found community-based ways to respond, you know, that, you know, the moms groups who set up learning centers, right, figuring out sort of how communities are really 
um, empowered themselves to, to, to respond in these situations and, and reacting to some of these kind of bigger policy decisions that are happening that are really negatively impacting them. But we really need to build in that cycle of feedback early on um, from the get-go. And I think it's also okay to admit that, you know, we got things wrong and, um, and to course correct and, and, and not just sort of stick with it because we know that this is, you know, one avenue and one way to, 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 to change the trajectory of the infectious disease outbreak, but noting that there are risks that we need to take to be able to maintain, you know, the access to essential services for children. Um, I always say children are half our constituency, and so we need to be putting at least more than half of our efforts into making sure that we're responding to their needs. There, It has, you know, long, long, long-term impacts, and I think we're going to see that from this COVID pandemic um, for many decades to come. So thank you. I really appreciate the time. Appreciate your comments. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Dr. Aisha, please go ahead. Yeah, um, just to build on what Kelly and Eddie just said, I think um, it's it is child, uh, so participation co-creation um, with children and communities is critical. It's not actually a nice to have. It's essential um, if we genuinely want to help people because they, again, they are experts in their own lives actually as well. They know what's going on. They know what's important. They know even if they don't prioritize it the way we might as a, a guest who's trying to help them um, and who has the resources to do it. And so we need to respect that and we need to um, engage appropriately and children absolutely are essential, um, but it does require certain skills. Um, to understand how to do that. And then the other thing, and I, I might be really throwing a spanner in the works here, but I think we need to reconsider uh, what we what, what we think about who is a child, like what's not necessarily what we think about it, but we need to be clear about what, who we're talking about um, because, and, and what this means for different children with different kinds of risks. So is, is this a child mother or are we talking about somebody who's, I don't know, um, two years old? And the risks for different children at different age groups um, in an outbreak setting or in any humanitarian crisis are different. And uh, we need to be able to understand what we're talking about and, and respond appropriately. And we need to be able to also measure and see these children. And right now they get lumped in. Some organizations who are very well respected are uh, measuring children under five and then five and above in their interventions. So if you're five, you're lumped in with a 60 year old, um, let alone all the different sort of variations and risks in health risks, for example, as you go from five to eight, eight to 12, 12, 13. I mean, you can, again, you can, you can divide it how you want, but who we're talking about um, and what happens then when that child becomes a mother what happens when that child is working and is the main breadwinner in the family? Does that mean now they have social responsibilities or, or a physical state, which makes them in the same group as an adult? How do we respond to them and their needs and their risks? Um, I think we need to examine these questions quite carefully. And I think we need to come to some kind of consensus so we can then more effectively engage with them and address their needs. Over. Great, thank you. We actually have time for a few questions. Um, and we, we do have one question that's come in. Um, if anybody um, has a question, please put it in the chat or um, Elspeth, if you could let me know if somebody raises their hand, we can call upon them. Um, and this is a question maybe Eddie or Kelly, you can also um, help Dr. Kadir answer. <laughs> but the question was directed to you, Doctor. Um, that you had mentioned one of the barriers to collaboration uh, is that health actors may not have the skills to engage with children. Um, so what are some of the key barriers or solutions that you see for effective cross-sectoral collaboration? So in my experience, um, what can be quite successful in terms of a solution, but which is a barrier is, uh, well, I guess a response to a barrier is starting to work, the solution is working together from the beginning. So you don't do, like you start from the needs assessment, a, a crisis happens, uh, an outbreak happens, you know, maybe, maybe you go into lockdown, maybe you don't, um, but people are moving around, things are happening. Um, then you have humanitarian actors who then land, uh, scale up, they start with needs assessments and coordination structures getting set up already at that stage we need to be working together across sectors. And what happens is, what the barrier is, is everyone goes into their own sector 
and they kind of get, you know, try to get their people in with the right skills in. And then next thing you know, people have, even if they're doing a needs assessment at the same time and in the same place, they're still separated in what they're what they're looking at and who they're speaking to and the people who are asking the questions and there and um and so you're already thinking about a response that is is by definition siloed and the way to change that is to start from the beginning by working together sit together and say right what are we gonna what are we gonna focus on what do we need to prioritize um how we need to how do we need to um how can we then address this? Um, then setting up, I think the other thing that's really key for accountability as well is to make sure that we develop integrated indicators so that we're actually tracking what we're doing, making sure that we're like our various sectors. I'm not saying that all responses need to be inter completely intersectoral. That would be a dream, that would be great. However, it isn't necessarily always practical having a field hospital and you can have you go into details you can have obviously you need to have a setup that's a safe and child friendly um setup however um the the degree of integration depending on the specialty is is going to be variable but we need to be doing it and we need to be measuring it um so that we know we are doing it we we can also then use that to track over time to see the effectiveness of interventions and one of the key things for that and especially for people who are working in child development and worrying about or thinking about children with additional needs or different needs is understanding the medium and long-term effects. Um, and the only way to do that is to have the right information. And you can see over time, you can actually, you, hopefully then we could compare what happens when you don't integrate and what happens when you do. And that will also be another case for why we should do that. It's a long answer. I hope that answers the question though. That was great. And um, I'll open that up. We, we still have a couple more minutes for questions. A, a new question has come in, but Eddie and Kelly also feel free um, to add to what Dr. Kadir has shared. Uh, but the other question um, is how um, we can look at accountability. So how can we work across sectors to ensure that we are accountable to children and families in child-centered um, infectious disease outbreak preparedness and response. So if Kelly, Eddie, or Dr. Kadir, if you have uh, anything to add to that. Perhaps uh, maybe less so on that last point, but maybe to pick up on, on uh, Dr. Aisha's point about working with children, I, I mean, and collaborating, perhaps there's some accountability to this as well. But as educators, we often look at school or that learning space as kind of the, the place. And I think Kelly mentioned that, right? As the center of, of how we, we work. I, if I reflect back to uh, the beginning of COVID-19 and how, how my own children reacted to that, there was a lot of nervousness. People didn't know what to believe. There was a lack of trust. Um, I, I think, and I want to be positive here, I want to say, how can schools, you know, with teachers, with uh, principals, collaborate with healthcare providers to help ensure that information is shared, how that information is communicated in a, in a way that children can can understand and then take that perhaps back to their family as well. And so I, I think there is something about trust there that ha, you know, has to be built and used um, uh, to, to ensure that we are kind of collaborating. And of course that has to be done from the beginning um, as, as well. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to, to pick up on that point. I, I thought it was an important one to, to pick up on. Uh, obviously in very onset emergency, perhaps in refugee crises, we do often work with health sector and nutrition sector, uh, using those learning spaces as the entry point for cross sectoral collaboration. And, and so I think we can learn about that uh, and apply it to, to a number of different settings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kelly, did you want to add something? Yeah, and just to kind of um, on that question and, and the previous as well, trying to think about from the donor perspective, how can we kind of hold uh, ourselves accountable to making sure that these are part and parcel. And I think it definitely comes down to um, from the very start in our assessments and um, uh, planning uh, policies. But I think as donors, we need to make sure that when we're funding in these emergency contacts rate, right, that we are doing our own due diligence to make sure that when we're looking at the scheme, the grand plans of um, you know, a humanitarian response, that these pieces are part of it. I think we saw that in the first kind of humanitarian response of COVID-19, right? Protection wasn't even, um, you know, as prioritized as we wanted to see. We weren't even seeing the basic services for child protection included in that. 
think there was a large rallying cry noting that this is really a mistake and that we have to be thinking about this more holistically. I think the same can be said for sort of the space in, in, in schools and, and as we were learning sort of the impact on children, the risks to children, et cetera, you know, revising that strategy, um, it was, was and could have been, I think, very helpful. So I think for us, it's also really just important that when we are putting our dollars um, to these responses, that we are also holding ourselves accountable to making sure that that due diligence is done and that these constituencies are covered um, as part of that response as well. And I think that was something for us um, to have learned um, early on in the in the pandemic as well. Thanks. Uh, I just want to add one thing to Please go ahead. Yeah. But yeah. Um, and that's that when you think about what happened in COVID. Um, at the very beginning, we, we didn't know how different groups would be affected. Um, we didn't know who was transmitting it. There was an assumption that was made by organizations that make the guidance that uh, and health authorities of countries that children would be sp spreading the disease because they are often spreading other diseases um, in that when I say spreading diseases, I mean that children uh, are, they're social, um, they interact with each other and, and they are also acquiring when they're, when they're young, especially, um, they are more likely to be in sort of groups where they're closer together, they're more likely to get certain illnesses and then they're seen as, uh, you know, they're seen as, as spreading things like the flu and RSV and colds in the winter. And so what happened was when this was a respiratory virus, everyone assumed that children would be spreading COVID. And so what did they do? One of the first things that happened was schools were shut down. And nobody was thinking about kids and what this does to their development, their social development, their emotional development, their motor development, their cognitive development, all of these things, the, the things that really are the most important for children um, were actually just completely disregarded. And because with an idea, this was for the greater good. Um, and we can't answer that sort of ethical question here in this session, but we need to recognize that that's actually what happened. And so children took the biggest hit in, in so many ways, but that is kind of very, for me, very representative of who's valued in society and how how decisions are made, especially when things get tough and you're not really sure what's happening. Sometimes it's important to, you know, to, to lock down and to isolate. Sometimes it's important to, sometimes we can even make a good argument, like in the case of Ebola, that we want to separate infants from newborn, uh, infants, sorry, newborns from their mothers. Um, with monkeypox, with COVID, these questions were happening. Do we separate a a mother from the newborn. This has massive health effects on, and also affects the attachment for, for both mother and child. So these are not things we should be taking lightly. Decisions that we should be making um, sort of very, you know, based on assumptions, we need to have a really good reason for it. Mm. And, um, and we don't always have that. But I think, so when we're thinking about, um, you know, when we're thinking about what how to how how do we work together? How do we how are we accountable? We need to rem, we actually need to work together to make sure that children are prioritized, that children are recognized as participants in their communities, um, and and we can do this both as humanitarian actors, but we also need to be pushing I think for decision makers at a governmental level or at an international sort of level because because the the problem about at the end of the day it it, it seems to be partly at least partly due to children being a lower priority than other people. Over. Thank you so much. Um, there's some further questions and we're gonna capture those, I believe. Isn't that right, Elspeth? Um, the questions that are in the chat and we'll try to capture those to share back. Thank you. Um, and just, you know, so many, just so many things resonate for me listening to everything that's said. Um, and yeah, just that exactly what you said, Dr. Kadir, you know, at that beginning stage, we, we do just, you know, we land at the emergency and we go to our sector, we go into our silos. And as you were saying, Kelly, we've got to be thinking about that holistic response from the get go. Um, you know, and the examples that Eddie's shared, you know, from context, uh, even from his own family and, and what's happened, the due diligence, um, you know, lots of lessons here. Um, 
to, to really reflect on. And the reality is the, the pandemic isn't really over. Um, personally, I spent the, the pandemic in Central America and at the moment I'm in Switzerland, um, completely different and the inequities are, are clear just from a personal side. And then hearing from our colleagues earlier, uh, Lebanon, uh, DRC, um, Colombia, this, you know, the inequities are clear. Uh, the most vulnerable have been affected overall. And today, ECW launched their new campaign and the, the new number of out of school children, 222 million is, is the number. In the midst of the pandemic, we were talking about 126 million. Before that, we were talking about 75 million, you know, it's, it's frightening. And, and I think often of a conversation I'd had with Robert Jenkins, the, the head of education at UNICEF, and he's like, we have got to make it clear that this is a critical emergency across the globe. Um, thank you for your, your comments and, and all the, the time you took to, to be here today. We're gonna now move to um, a mentee, which I've actually, believe it or not, with all this Zoom training and everything, I've never done a mentee. So I'm hoping it works. <laughs> and it seems to, there's actually a link for you. Um, thanks to the team, they've made it very easy. And I will give you the question, which is, what is one action that you can take forward as an individual or organization to advance the recommendations? So this is an open-ended, uh, mentee. So, so no problems with just voting once. So please go ahead. We're going to take a second, take a look at what you've put in there for us. I'll just start reading the ones I can. Uh, learn how to communicate with children, advocate for stronger intersectoral collaboration, continue to engage children in research and co-creation of actions and response, um, continue to promote integrated child protection, education, health, social protection programming, which can prepare. This is like one of those readers that uh, you know, sees how fast I can read. Uh, continue to strengthen working across sectors, especially health. Um, support response teams to work across sectors from the very start of an outbreak response or humanitarian response more generally. Um, capacity building and awareness raising activities to have strong multi-sectoral collaboration um, in the short term, study and revise the implementation of public policies aimed at reducing inequality gaps in health services, social support, and education for children and young people in vulnerable contexts. For those of you who don't know Education Cannot Wait, let me just say one word and then I'll direct you to our website, educationcannotwait.org to learn a little bit more. But we are uh, an education in emergencies fund where we work to prioritize more funding for education and ensuring that education is prioritized at the onset of a crisis. And certainly that education is prioritized in protracted situations as well. I believe I only have three minutes per question. So I'm not gonna go into our COVID-19 response, um, but perhaps I'll try to weave a little bit of that into, into some of our responses. But I think this is a great question to start with because, um, that's right. I mean, there is strong collaboration between education and, and child protection. Of course, we see that at the, the global level, but also at the country level. The INE minimum standards uh, promote that. We have the CP minimum standards. The Alliance strategic pillar number uh, three, I think it is, uh, highlights this. And of course, we have the CP uh, EIE framework as well. Uh, so there is a, a lot of collaboration and ECW likes to build on this and designing its, its programmings. Uh, but let me, let me speak a little bit to this. I mean, unfortunately, as was mentioned, I think in one of the opening remarks, it is likely that we will expect to see some type of interruption to learning again. Uh, hopefully not to the same extent, but perhaps again at a global scale. So, I think there are a lot of learnings that we can apply both within this and then in the next question I'll, I'll address later when it comes to involvement with national government. And um, we, you know, this is also gonna be shared, I believe, um, as the responses are coming in, it looks like we have 16 so far. So please take a moment and, and add those. You know, I find often when you do actually write these things down, you kind of have a better chance of making it happen. So I encourage you to, 
to really think about that. The whole holistic public health response includes attending to child protection, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I won't um, try to pronounce the other languages because I'm afraid my pronunciation won't be so great, but um, please take a look at those if you can read uh, the other languages. So yes, thank you. Um, with that, I just wanted to let you know that um, for those of you who don't know Education Cannot Wait, let me just say one word and then I'll direct you to our website, educationcannotwait.org to learn a little bit more. But we are uh, an education and emergencies fund where we work to prioritize more funding for education and ensuring that education is prioritized at the onset of a crisis. And certainly that education is prioritized in protracted situations as well. I believe I only have three minutes per question, so I'm not going to go into our COVID-19 response, um, but perhaps I'll try to weave a little bit of that into, into some of our responses. But I think this is a great question to start with because um, that's right. I mean, there is strong collaboration between education and, and child protection. Of course, we see that at the, the global level, but also at the country level. The INE minimum standards uh, promote that. We have the CP minimum standards, the Alliance strategic pillar number uh, three, I think it is, uh, highlights this. And of course, we have the CP uh, EIE framework as well. Uh, so there is a, a lot of collaboration and ECW likes to build on this and in designing its, its programmings. Uh, but let me, let me speak a little bit to this. I mean, unfortunately, as was mentioned, I think in one of the opening remarks, it is likely that we will expect to see some type of interruption to learning again. Uh, hopefully not to the same extent, but perhaps again at a global scale. So I think there are a lot of learnings that we can apply both within this and then in the next question I'll, I'll address later when it comes to involvement with national government. I have one more direction to share with you. And that is we will be posting a Google form and that's for you to um, sign up if you would like further information and and for folks to keep in touch with you. So, so watch uh, for that, and that will be uh, posted in the chat. Um, and at this point, I am very happy uh, to introduce to you uh, and hand over the floor to um, the executive director of the Elevate Children Funders Group, uh, Heather Hamilton, and looking forward to the chance where we get to meet in person, Heather. Uh, so welcome, thank you. Yes, indeed, Dean. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting many, many of the folks I've been collaborating with over the past two years in this job in person soon. Um, I am double hatting here today, and I'll try to be quick because we're at the end. Laura Savage, who's the executive director of the International Education Funders Group, one of the other co-sponsors of this, this meeting, couldn't make it at the last minute, but she shared some remarks, and I wanted to highlight a couple of her thoughts and to leave you all with the challenge. Uh, Laura was really impressed um, that there were student and community voices elevated here, and she noted that it's almost always missing in any discussion of education policy anywhere, let alone in these contexts where the children are some of the most disadvantaged in the world. And that their perspectives really echo findings from other global uh, research on the impact of COVID-19 and co school closures on students and teachers, including that what that was consolidated in last year's Global Education Evidence Advisory Panel. She notes that the scale of the problem is plain to see, the education crisis has exacerbated, and yet that message somehow fails to land among those who hold the power to fund or change the way education works. And she noted that these are really concrete recommendations. There isn't a magic solutions list, um, but that these are really concrete recommendations. And that it would be good to feed them into the futures of education debate led by UNESCO this and next year. So I'm now putting on my own hat as executive director of Elevate Children Funders Group. And I, I wanna share that we were delighted to co-sponsor this launch event, which reminds us that schools are not just places of learning and children are not just learners. They are whole people. The closure of schools had uh, these significant adverse effects, not just on educational outcomes, which was really widely talked about at the time, but on children's safety and holistic well-being, and as we saw in this report, on the well-being of their families and communities. 
We were reminded with this research and on the call that while schools have returned to in-person learning, the negative impact of school closures and remote learning haven't stopped for these children. They haven't been resolved. We haven't caught up on learning and we haven't addressed the harms to children. So for millions of children, the harms of this pandemic continue. And we're, remind, we're reminded that as usual, these harms hit the most vulnerable and marginalized hardest. We're left with a really clear call to action to make sure that we reach the children who are still living with the impacts of COVID-19 school closures and that we implement policies and guidance for future infectious disease outbreaks that center children and their well-being, particularly, but not only in humanitarian emergencies. We're also reminded that we have an obligation to ensure children's families and communities participation in response and planning. And as our panelists stressed, children don't experience life in silos. Everyone, every sector, every type of actor at all levels has a role to play. And we have to work together from the beginning across sectors. It's our collective responsibility to take forward the recommendations from this study and turn them into concrete actions. So I encourage you to make a plan right now to implement that one thing you wrote in the mentee, that one thing that you can do to take forward these recommendations. So thank you for taking the time to be here. Thanks to all of our wonderful panelists and to the report authors. It really was an incredible event. Enjoy the rest of your day.